Welcome to an introduction to chemistry brought to you by Parkbench Tutors. For more information on Parkbench Tutors, look us up on Facebook or visit parkbenchtutors.com. In this short podcast, this is a support tutorial on phase changes, so you should have already done some work on phase changes. There are three phases, a solid, a liquid, and a gas, right? Those are our three phases, solid, liquid, gas. And of course you can change between those phases. If you change from solid to liquid, that's melting. If you change from liquid to gas, that's boiling or vaporization. If you change from a gas to a liquid, that's condensing. And if you change from the liquid to the solid, that is freezing. So what do we know about liquids? Well, in gas molecules, the molecules actually represent less than 1% of total volume, but in a liquid the molecules represent a much higher 70% of total volume. The forces between the molecules in a liquid then are going to be more important because the molecules are closer together. So liquids expand and contract far less when you change the temperature. Molecules in a liquid still move around, of course they move around much faster in a gas. So increasing the temperature of a liquid increases the kinetic energy of the molecules, although of course the molecules in a cold liquid have less kinetic energy than those of a hot liquid, and the molecules of a hot liquid have less kinetic energy than those of a gas. But if a molecule gets enough kinetic energy, then it can overcome the forces that are trying to keep it together, and it escapes the liquid and it goes into the gaseous phase. So a molecule leaves a liquid when it's got sufficient kinetic energy to overcome the attractive forces. That's the change of phase. And on average the kinetic energy of the remaining molecules is lowered slightly, so if you could say a temperature would be lowered slightly. Right, if we have a beaker of water we put it under a bell jar. Now at first the level of the water falls very slightly because there are going to be some water molecules which will have sufficient kinetic energy to break free of the surface and they will enter the gas phase. But after time you would find the level remains steady because the number of molecules leaving the liquid will be the same as the number of molecules entering the liquid. In other words the number of molecules going from the liquid to the gaseous phase will be the same as the number of molecules going from the gaseous phase to the liquid phase and we use the term phase equilibrium to describe this sort of state of affairs. The system is said to have dynamic equilibrium, right? So there's always change occurring even though the overall p position is going to be the same. Le Chatelier was the chemist who first put forward that idea. Suppose you have a closed system of a beaker beneath a bell jar and we increase the temperature of that by 10 degrees. What's going to happen? Well, the kinetic energy of the molecules, the average kinetic energy is going to be increased. So initially more molecules are going to escape from the surface of the liquid and enter the gaseous phase and that will continue until you get a new equilibrium. The molecules of water that are in equilibrium with the liquid exert a pressure and that's called the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at that temperature. What happens when something boils? Well, heating the beaker of water increases the number of molecules leaving the liquid and it will then increase the vapour pressure above the liquid. So at some point the vapour pressure becomes equal to the pressure above the liquid. So the average kinetic energy of the molecules are high enough so that they can continually leave the liquid. And that temperature is of course known as the boiling point of the liquid. So as temperature increases, molecules get more kinetic energy and at some point the kinetic energy is such that they are insufficient for the liquid phase to exist. So in other words, all the molecules go into the gas phase and the temperature at which this occurs is the critical temperature. So we have the idea of critical temperature and pressure. So above the critical temperature it's not going to be possible to liquefy a gas no matter how much pressure there is. But at the critical temperature there will be a minimum pressure to liquefy the gas. If the pressure is below that the liquid phase will not form, so that pressure is known as the critical pressure. Right, solids have definite position and shape, the particles vibrate, there are strong ionic forces or covalent forces, so the particles don't move around in a solid. Some solids can be heated and they'll turn directly to vapour 
uh, that is called sublimation and that occurs with carbon dioxide and with iodine but in most cases with increased temperature the particles gain more energy and so at some point they have sufficient energy to break free from a fixed position and they move around and that's called melting and the temperature which this occurs is called the melting point and the energy required to cause that change of state is the heat of fusion so we can put this information on a diagram and we call this the triple point diagram so to understand this diagram B is the triple point because if you can see all three phases would be in equilibrium solid liquid and vapor and as the pressure is lowered so boiling point is going to be lowered and as the pressure is raised boiling point is raised if the pressure is decreased then the freezing point is raised and at standard pressure E represents the melting point and F will represent the boiling point summarize that so B is the triple point because all three phases could exist in equilibrium when pressure is lowered boiling points lowered pressure is raised boiling point is raised pressure is decreased freezing point is raised and at standard pressure E represents the melting point F re represent the boiling point okay with pure water right you obviously get rid of all sorts of impurities now water from our taps isn't pure so what we would have to do is distill it and, and that's basically evaporate the water and then condense the water vapor the substances that have got a higher boiling point would remain behind so pure water then uh, will remove dissolved gases and liquids with low boiling points and then what comes off after that will be pure water right so you don't collect the substances that come off before the boiling point of water hardness of water is due to impurities in water mainly by carbonates of calcium magnesium iron and they can actually be removed by boiling unfortunately if you have water in your area which is considered to be hard in other words it has these bicarbonates and you pass hot water through pipes then you will get a scale formed from the precipitates of these carbonates by carbonates so the term permanent hard hardness is slightly different that means you've got impurities of sulfates and chlorides of calcium magnesium in the water those aren't going to be removed by boiling and uh, those are what form the scum around a bathtub because they react with soap you can remove hardness by using something called a water softener zeolite is a typical water softener and it exchanges ions so that calcium ions are replaced with those of sodium right, electrolysis of water shows it's made of two parts of hydrogen one part of oxygen so we could synthesize water by igniting or burning hydrogen and oxygen gas together and that would show that your gases combine in the ratio of two parts hydrogen one part oxygen you could also pass hydrogen over copper oxide to get water the copper oxide would be reduced the hydrogen would be oxidized in terms of mass one gram of hydrogen joins with eight grams of oxygen and that gives nine grams of water so here's a simple calculation if you have something called a udiometer which keeps water in the steam phase at the start you get 12 grams of hydrogen and 24 grams of oxygen so how much water would be formed and how much unchanged gas would you get well we know that water forms in the ratio of 1 to 8 we know we've got 24 grams of oxygen and that would normally require divide that by 8 3 grams of hydrogen so 3 grams of hydrogen plus 24 grams of oxygen would give 27 grams of water so it would be the hydrogen that wasn't fully used so take away the 3 grams that are used and you're left with the 9 grams of hydrogen a more sort of complex problem if you get 8 milliliters of hydrogen 200 milliliters of air and you spark it what is the total volume that you're going to get left with so 200 mL of air has got 20% of oxygen or 40 milliliters and hydrogen and oxygen combine in the proportion of 2 to 1 so 
8 mils of hydrogen will combine with 4 mils of oxygen giving 8 mils of steam we're talking about volume here so there's going to be 196 mil of air because 4 milliliters of oxygen have been used and there's going to be 8 milliliters of steam so the total volume of the gases 196 plus 8 is 204 milliliters heavy water is a term that you will hear used and that's an, uh, when water is formed using an isotope of hydrogen uh, usually deuterium and that combines with oxygen so an atom of deuterium is slightly different from normal hydrogen it has one proton and one neutron in the nucleus there's also a further isotope of hydrogen which has got one proton and two neutrons this is called tritium or tritium depends how you want to pronounce that you may also have heard the term peroxide peroxides are when you've got more oxygen than would normally be expected hydrogen peroxide used to be used for bleaching and you can see that two oxygens share electrons and hydrogen also shares an electron with the oxygen so that's the formula H2O2 calorimetry is when you try and record the amount of heat which is concerned with what happens when a a water changes a phase and one of the things that you notice is that whilst the phase change is actually occurring there isn't a continuous change of temperature so you've got some ice you keep heating it and measure the temperature of the ice and of course it will keep going up until you get to that point where it starts melting and turning to water and then the temperature remains the same until it's turned to water keep going with the water and you'll reach a point where it boils and where it starts turning to steam or water vapor and again the temperature won't change whilst that phase change is occurring so energy then must be used up during these phase changes and it takes 80 calories of heat to change a gram of ice to water that's the heat of fusion and it takes 540 calories of heat to change a gram of water to steam and that's called the heat of vaporization in terms of joules 80 calories is 3.34 times 10 to the 2 joules per gram and 540 calories is 2.26 times 10 to the 3 joules per gram that energy that's being used while you get that change of phase is used to break the bonding forces so if we look at a typical calculation involving a calorimetry how much ice does uh, not sorry how much ice can be melted by 6800 calories of heat it takes well the heat required will be equal to the heat of fusion times the mass of the substance so we have 6800 calories and we know that the heat of fusion is 80 so 6800 must be equal to 80 times the mass which comes to 85 grams so you can melt 85 grams of ice take one further example how much heat do you need to change 100 grams of ice to 100 grams of steam note that you've got two phase changes here first of all you've got to change the ice to water that's going to be 100 times 80 which is 8000 calories then you've got the amount needed to heat the water to 100 uh, that's the mass times the change in temperature so 100 times 100 is 10,000 and then you've got the amount needed to change the 100 grams of water to steam which will be 100 times 540 and finally if we add all that together we should be left with 72,000 calories required or 72 kilocalories the term anhydride refers to oxides that react with water metal oxides react with water to form bases called hydroxides for example sodium oxide plus water gives sodium hydroxide or metal oxide plus water gives metal hydroxide non-metallic oxides usually react with water to form acids for example sulfur trioxide plus water giving sulfuric acid so non-metallic oxide plus water gives an acid Water is unusual when you freeze it because its greatest density is at 4 degrees so when you actually cool it from 4 degrees to 0 degrees it actually expands and that expansion is the cause of burst pipes after you get a cold spell 
So for most liquids, cooling reduces the energy of the molecules. They come closer together and eventually you get a solid. But in contrast, ice crystals come together in a loose structure bound by hydrogen bonds. And it's that structure that accounts for the change in densities, right? So you have a loose structure with hydrogen bonds. We can represent it like that if you like. The red dotted lines are the hydrogen bonds that you're going to get. So why hydrogen bonds? That's because the negative charge of the oxygen attracts a positive charge from nearby hydrogen and that's what gives you the weak hydrogen bond. That ends our revision section on phase changes brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Park Bench Tutors, please look us up at parkbenchtutors.com or on Facebook.